All right, well, why don't we get going? Um, thanks everyone. Um, it's good to see folks. Um, if you're listening in for the very first time, this is a meeting of the Maine Climate Council, sort of a special webinar uh, that we have today, two hour webinar. Um, and my name is David Plum. I'm just helping to uh, facilitate these meetings. Um, in just a moment, I'll talk about the agenda, but before we do that, um, I wanna turn it over uh, to Climate Council Co-Chair Hannah Pingree um, to give us a sense of what we're trying to do today. Uh, and then I'm happy to throw some agenda information in the chat whenever you need, Hannah. Uh, but Hannah, please go ahead and uh, give us a, an outlook of what we're trying to do today. Great. Sarah is just pulling up a quick slide and I'm gonna put Melanie on the spot as well. So just a reminder, this is a um, optional, but it's great to see such a good turnout meeting to talk about the Maine Climate Council's emission modeling. Um, we have uh, been going around about this since the working groups really dove in and kicked off this process with Synapse, our consultants, um, for many months now going back to early in the new year. Um, but obviously, this emissions modeling is pretty key for making sure that what we recommend will get Maine on the path of where we need to go. So we're going to have um, Synapse really go through a pretty detailed, their most current emissions modeling. I'm going to have Sarah just give you a clip, quick kind of recap of the process. Um, but just a couple of opening um, comments. I mean, this is obviously crucial for our work to really determine the specific outcomes on the emissions reduction side. Um, they're going to go into our plan. And I know a lot of you um, who are paying close attention have said, you know, we want to see specifics of what does this actually mean. And these modeling results that you're going to see today give you those specifics, give us all those specifics. Um, so it, just a couple quick comments. And I'm going to ask Melanie to quickly just remind folks about DEP's biannual um, emissions reporting process um, and maybe also introduce Stacy who's on the phone who who does the heavy lifting on that work um, but the first point I want to make is just um, and Steve will probably give you a longer version of this is that modeling isn't perfect so this is a roadmap of how Maine can get to our 45 percent reduction but we know that there are things that could change there are changes in technology that will impact us from the outside. So I think while this is crucial for us to get Maine on a path towards reducing our emissions, um, it's really important to fully understand that this is one pathway and a pathway that represents the best, best technology and options that we know are available at this point. But we know there will be, in good ways, innovations that will make a difference. There will be federal policy actions that we hope eventually will make a positive difference. Um, and then there are other changes, whether it's natural events, whether it's markets, um, whether it's um, other backsliding that could have a negative impact on these this pathway. So I think this again is extremely helpful for us to be more specific about how we get Maine on a mission reduction pathway, um, but to also know that this isn't perfect. And we are creating a four-year plan to really start Maine on this path, but you know, as those four years wind up, we will definitely redo this modeling to think about what tweaks need to be made, um, how much of an impact are we having using this pathway, and what else needs to be done. Um, so I'll just quickly pass it to Melanie, because I think it's important to just be clear that um, we know what ideally each EV on the road or heat pump installed means for reducing the state's emissions. The ultimate um, testament to whether we are making progress is the work that the DEP does. So I think it's just it's good to just be reminded of the DEP's um, emissions report, how that works, where their data comes from, and just Melanie can give you a quick reminder of that. Thanks, Anna. Um, so as Hannah mentioned, our emissions inventory manager is here with us today. And Stacy, I can't see you. So if you're out there, if you want to turn your video on and wave to everybody, please feel free to do so. Um, but no pressure. And um, I believe Stacy has covered this with the group um, potentially at the very beginning of our process. But as Hannah said, I'll just take you through really quickly. 
uh, Department of Environmental Protection has now for many years produced a biennial report of greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Um, our report is an estimate. So just like modeling is our best guess at the effect that these strategies will have, our emissions um, that we report out are also estimates. So it's our best guess at what the atmosphere is seeing as a result of the activities that occur in Maine. We primarily use a modeling tool provided by the US EPA. It's the state inventory tool. Uh, one of the benefits of using that tool is um, that it enables us to apply the same methodology as other states are using. So we can roughly compare our numbers to other states' numbers to the same type of activities and inputs that are being measured across the nation, um, as well as to EPA's annual greenhouse gas report. Um, it has been improved over time. That model is continuously being improved. It relies very heavily on data from the Energy Information Administration. So it focuses in large part on energy consumption, which is a primary driver for our greenhouse gas emissions in the state. In the Climate Council legislation that passed, it continued to require the department to issue that report biennially. So the next one is due to the legislature in January of 2022. Uh, Stacy and her team are working on um, updating it and evaluating the various inputs, recognizing the importance of it now to help us track these emission reductions uh, toward our targets. We're trying to refine that as best we can. Um, and one of the things that we are required to do by that legislation is to adopt rules by July of 2021 uh, that establish how we will be monitoring and tracking our progress. And so this will not be the last time that this group has the opportunity to participate in discussions about how those um, emissions are estimated. That will be part of a subsequent stakeholder process um, that we'll be pursuing once this plan is in place. Uh, the timing of those reports, with it being every two years, also gives us the opportunity to think of the next one in 2022 as sort of an interim report on our progress. So you're engaged in a four-year planning process. Two years from now, we'll get a good first cut at how things are shaking out. You know, that's going to take into account changes in our economy related to this pandemic. We're always working with data that's a little bit behind in time, um, but it will enable us to see some of those changes that have happened and some of the preliminary effects of these strategies. So that's gonna be a great opportunity to regroup and think about what things we need to focus on for the next four-year plan to see where we've made a difference and where there's still things that need to be done. Awesome, thank you, Melanie. Stacy, where are you? Just, are you, up, you're out there? Just say a quick hi. I'm here. Hi. Excellent. Well, great to see you. And Stacy is the expert on Maine's emissions. And Melanie used to have her job. So Melanie is also an expert. So just mm -hmm. awesome that we have them both um, a part of our work. Um, so just again, the agenda for this meeting is really to hear about the modeling results, get your questions answered. We're going to hear a little bit from some of the co-chairs who are most involved in putting together the recommendations that led to um, the results you're going to see today. Um, I'm going to pass it to Sarah just to talk a little bit about process and introduce um, Steve from Synapse. So um, anything else, David, before I pass it to Sarah? Just to say we're going to do about a half hour, 40 minutes of this initial conversation um, where Sarah is going to say a few things. Synapse is going to, going to lay out this uh, new run of the modeling. Sarah is going to say a little bit about the implications of the modeling and the objectives in your climate action. Uh, plan. Um, and then we're going to get some quick feedback, particularly on the EV issue and the heat pump issue from Michael Starler, Sauter and I think from Joyce Taylor, if Joyce, if you're here. Um, so we'll do that. And then we're going to do some discussion. So if you have questions as you're going, maybe type them in the chat, um, type, write them on a piece of paper, don't forget them. We're just going to get all that out there first and then have some discussion around the whole package. So with that, um, Sarah, go Thanks, ahead. Thanks, David. Yeah. Um, so I just want to kind of briefly remind everybody where we are in the, the modeling process. So we've been working with ERG and Synapse since early spring. They worked with each of the working groups, the transportation working group, the buildings working group, and the energy working group, really to, 
to identify what some of the paths might be to get us to our emission reduction goals. And so in real time, they've been working to, to help us understand the data and think about what the different strategies could accomplish. Um, when we added up all of the different strategies that were being recommended by the working groups, we found that we were still shy of being able to meet the 2030 and 2050 goals. And so we have been continuing to work with Synapse and with the co-chairs of those working groups over the last several weeks and months to try and get a path um, that gets us to hit those 2030 and 2050 goals. So it's definitely been a really great collaborative process. And I just want to say thank you to ERG and Synapse for, for continuing to slog through this data with us and to the working group co-chairs and staff who've, who've kept at this. Um, but it was really important to us to be able to lay out a path forward that met the goals. So that's what we've been continuing to work on. And then, um, as David said, after we get through the Synapse presentation, I will do a little bit of connecting the dots in terms of how these model results inform the outcomes and targets that we'll have in the plan that we'll review next week. Um, so looking forward to the discussion. And with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. And I think everyone can see my screen. Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, great. Well, again, uh, thank you all for the opportunity to uh, present to you this afternoon the um, final uh, mitigation modeling work that we um, have recently completed, again, in collaboration with uh, many of the folks in this room, this virtual room this afternoon. And as I was uh, preparing for this presentation, I was kind of reflecting on um, when we started this work in March of uh, 2020, which uh, seems like a lifetime ago. Um, but at that point, we, we recognized that there was uh, addressing climate change requires uh, a fundamental transformation of our energy systems, uh, the way we use energy, the technologies we engage with. And at that point in, in March, it was really a kind of an abstract concept. We have to transform our energy systems. And, and yeah, okay, we can shake our heads and say, okay, we understand that. And over the past uh, six to seven months, we really brought that abstract concept of energy transformation into a clear focus in what uh, it might take for Maine to meet its greenhouse gas reduction targets, both in 2030 and in 2050. So we've really taken that abstract concept of energy transformation and really refined that and brought that into focus. Uh, and the purpose, again, is, as um, Hannah suggested, is really to guide policies and regulations uh, to move us towards a low carbon uh, economy. So I will be presenting this afternoon with my colleague, uh, Jason Frost, um, who will be uh, presenting um, the uh, sector modeling for transportation and buildings. And then I will uh, take it from that point and talk about the electric sector modeling, uh, our economy-wide emissions trajectories, and then uh, we will turn it over to Sarah and we can entertain uh, conversation and questions at that point. So I know folks uh, hopefully are familiar with Synapse. We are based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we are a um, leader in energy sector modeling, um, energy and environmental economics. Um, we were started in the late 1990s and uh, we largely serve public interest clients, um, including um, governor's offices here in the state of Maine. We've also worked with a number of other organizations in Maine, including Efficiency Maine Trust, <clears throat> the Office of the Public Advocate, and we work uh, not only in New England, but across the country. So we bring to our work uh, a national perspective and deep expertise in energy economics and modeling. And so uh, we're very uh, pleased and honored to be part of this process, and uh, from here we'll start to dive in. So as was mentioned, uh, Synapse uh, was uh, collaborated with ERG. Uh, ERG was responsible for doing the uh, adaptation analysis and work, and Synapse was hired uh, based on our energy sector modeling expertise to work with the um, work, various working groups to uh, investigate the impact of various strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the state of Maine. So the modeling that we conducted throughout this project was in these three different sector areas. Uh, transportation sector, we use a model called EV Ready. 
uh, which is a stock flow model. It looks at the vehicle fleet in the state of Maine and how that fleet will transform over time, uh, given uh, kind of business as usual or different policies that are encouraging electrification. Similarly, we use another model for the building sector, which we uh, refer to as the building decarbonization calculator. And again, this is a stock flow model that has uh, in it um, data on all the heating systems for residential and commercial buildings based on um, Energy Information Administration data from the US Department of Energy. And we can look at that stock, how it evolves and changes over time and evaluate the emissions uh, impacts uh, from that transformation. And the third model we use is a model called Encompass. This is an electric sector, what we call capacity expansion and production cost model. And for those of you, I think most of you know that Maine is part of a larger regional grid, the New England grid, which is operated by the New England independent system operator. So the electric sector modeling um, included Maine, but it also included the larger New England grid as these are integrated markets where resources are developed and shared across the various New England states. So the modeling began by um, developing what we call a baseline, uh, what we refer to as a sustained policy scenario. So given the current set of policies that Maine has in place today, what will the future uh, emissions look like in these um, various uh, sectors, transportation buildings in the electric sector. So Maine has in place some uh, excellent programs and policies and those policies and programs were reflected in that baseline. So looking forward, if we do, um, given what we know today and existing policies and programs, what will emissions look like say 2030 through 2050? So that's the baseline, what we call sustained policy scenario. So that sustained policy scenario, um, as you'll see at the end of this slide, does not uh, achieve Maine's greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. So um, to address that, we worked with the various working groups to identify a suite of strategies and programs that would uh, transform systems, deploy technologies uh, in a variety of different scenarios. So we developed scenarios across the various energy sectors and we modeled those scenarios and those scenarios allow us to make a comparison between the baseline and these various strategies that are being considered to drive down greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the state of Maine. These policy scenarios that we've uh, really, um, the, the different levers and, and what we call dials that we have to, to, to turn to look at what the impacts would be uh, are fairly uh, confined. We've got uh, the ability to look at um, beneficial electrification, transformation of uh, internal combustion vehicles to EVs, uh, home heating systems that use fuels to uh, electricity in the form of heat pumps. We also have the ability in our models to look at a variety of efficiency improvements. And efficiency could mean reduction in vehicle miles traveled in the transportation sector, or it could mean uh, weatherizing homes and reducing the heating load uh, that homes require during the cold winter months in the state of Maine. And uh, we also did consider uh, displacing traditional fuels with low carbon fuels. And we also considered additional policies uh, that encourage uh, deployment of renewable, renewable energy technologies. Maine already has a very aggressive renewable, por renewable portfolio standard. Uh, and we looked at an, uh, another scenario that had a more, uh, even more aggressive uh, program to transform the electric power sector. So with that overview, I'm gonna um, turn it over to my colleague, Jason, who's going to walk us through both the transportation sector modeling and the uh, buildings uh, modeling. Thanks, Steve. Um, so starting off with the transportation sector, um, as Steve was describing, we used our, our EV ready model to focus in on um, emissions and electricity consumption from motor vehicles in particular. There are a couple um, other smaller categories under transportation, um, such as uh, air travel, rail, and marine um, energy consumption, but those are all much smaller than uh, the cars and trucks on the road. So we focused on um, motor vehicles and the on-road emissions. Uh, so this slide shows the five cases we developed. The baseline, as Steve was describing, um, is on the left. It's a, a relatively 
conservative sustained policies case, there are various projections out there about um, how quickly electric vehicle adoption will accelerate. Um, and we use the Energy Information Administration's projection, which is on the lower side compared to some of the others. Then we have the T1, T2, and T3 scenarios, which we had originally developed to meet the 2050 emissions reduction, reduction goal. Um, and these combine strategies in different ways. We have uh, the T1 scenario, which focuses on electrification, the T2 scenario, which um, focuses on both electrification as well as efficiency, um, mostly in the form of reducing vehicle miles traveled, um, but it also includes a little bit extra uh, fuel efficiency for the remaining gasoline vehicles. And then T3 um, uses some assumed uh, net zero carbon fuels. Um, so it's, it, it uses a little bit less electrification to meet the goal. And then um, more recently, we added the T4 scenario um, and, and it's uh, the corresponding scenario in the thermal sector to meet the state's 2030 emissions target in addition to the 2050 emissions target. So for this scenario, we had to move up some of the, some of the targets. Um, EV adoption is now uh, even faster in both the light duty and heavy duty vehicle um, subsectors. Uh, we also um, ha have significant vehicle miles traveled uh, reductions in the scenario, um, again, both for light and heavy duty vehicles. Um, so those, those combined help us meet the uh, emissions reduction target for 2030, which is 45% um, below 1990 levels. We can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so this, this slide shows uh, how light duty EV adoption progresses in, in each of the scenarios we've identified. Um, so as you can see in both the T1 uh, and T2 scenarios, which are actually uh, the same in this chart, as well as the more recent T4 scenario, we have um, EV adoption picking up very quickly, reaching kind of significant market share by the mid 2020s, um, and then essentially accounting for most of the, the new vehicle market in by 2030. Um, so in our, in our original T1 and T2 scenarios, we had EV sales reaching 69% of all new cars and trucks um, in 2030. And in our T4 scenario to meet the 2030 target, um, we've increased that to 85% of new light duty vehicles. Um, and in this case, we're counting both um, all electric or battery electric vehicles, as well as plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in, in this category. We uh, did a similar analysis for the heavy duty vehicle sector, um, which we do expect to lag light duty vehicles as far as um, zero emissions vehicle adoption. So in this sector in particular, we're showing adoption of both electric vehicles and also um, other zero emissions technologies. And the, the primary alternative is likely to be hydrogen fuel cell heavy duty vehicles. Um, so we see in, in our T1 and T2 scenario, we had um, heavy duty uh, zero emission vehicle adoption kind of uh, just starting to take off around 2030 where um, zero emissions vehicles account for a quarter of all new sales. Um, and in our T4 scenario, that has been increased to 55% of new vehicles um, just due to the kind of a long lag time, um, the, the amount of time it takes for new sales to transform the entire vehicle fleet, which should obviously includes um, many older vehicles. This is a problem we encountered for, for light duty vehicles as well. Um, so we needed to, to move up um, adoption of these vehicles to even earlier than 2030 to be able to see significant emissions reductions by 2030. Can go to the next slide. Um, so now when we, when we put those two um, EV adoption trajectories in to our model, um, as well as the reductions in vehicle miles traveled that we showed um, for, for each of the sectors, we get outputs in terms of total energy consumption, um, which we can then uh, kind of use to calculate the greenhouse gas emissions that result. 
um, all four of our decarbonization scenarios um, exceed 80% emissions reductions within the transportation sector, um, ranging from 82 to 87%. Um, and you can see in this chart, they, they vary a little bit in terms of how, how quickly those reductions take place. Um, and in general, we see that the T3 and T4 scenarios see faster emissions reductions, and that's due to the use of low carbon fuels in the T3 scenario, which is a bit of a, a faster drop in replacement. Um, and in the T4 scenario, that's due to reductions in vehicle miles traveled, which can be seen um, or which, which can have an effect on emissions in the, the short to midterm because it doesn't need, it doesn't require the, the vehicle fleet to turn over in the way that vehicle electrification does. Um, but ultimately, when we approach 2050, in all of these cases, the, the majority of the emissions reductions are coming from vehicle electrification, which tends to be the largest lever in the sector. Um, and since electric vehicles are, are such a key strategy here, we're, we also uh, evaluated the impact on um, electricity consumption and on the electric sector. Uh, so we, we see significant um, new electricity consumption, especially by 2050, when essentially the whole fleet has turned over um, in, in all of these scenarios. Really, the only scenario that, that sees lower electricity consumption is the T3 scenario, T3 scenario in which um, low carbon fuels are used as, an, as a partial alternative to vehicle electrification. Um, and in particular, in, in the T4 scenario, we see this growth in, in electric consumption happening even a little sooner than the others. Um, but, but really, on this chart, it's, it's just a couple years, uh, couple couple years earlier than in our other scenarios. And that's again because we had to move up um, EV adoption so that by 2030 we already saw some amount of um, EV penetration in the total vehicle fleet. And with that, we'll move on to the building sector where we have um, a similar set of scenarios and, and a similar set of results that kind of correspond to all the slides uh, just presented for the transportation scenario. So again, we have this kind of parallel set of, set of scenarios where we've, we've labeled them with H's instead of T's for heating. Um, we have a baseline case where um, we assume that means current uh, heat pump adoption policies continue, um, which uh, increases heat pump adoption significantly through the 2020s, then we kind of assume that um, less, less happens after that because we don't have as, as clear of a sense of what policies will look like beyond 2030. Um, and then we also assume some uh, or a roughly continued amount of building weatherization um, in the residential sector. We then have our H1, H2, and H3 scenarios, which have been um, presented previously and were all, again, designed to meet the 2050 goal. Um, some of the highlights here, we, we have these aiming for about 90% of households and 90% of um, commercial heating load to be met with heat pumps um, in the H1 and H2 scenarios, which are electrification focused. We also um, include significant weatherization in the H2 scenario. And then the H3 scenario, similar to the transportation sector, involves some low carbon fuels and a little bit less electrification. This time we've added the H4 scenario, um, which again, as we saw with the transportation sector, moves adoption of beneficial electrification technologies um, and, and really heat pumps in particular. Um, up a little bit um, and, and also um, increases weatherization a little bit beyond our H1 scenario uh, so that we can meet the, meet the target in 2030 in addition to the 2050 longer term target. So in our heat pump adoption modeling, we look at um, two different scenarios in uh, the residential sector um, today, a lot of heat pumps are being installed as retrofits, 
in households that maintain their legacy heating system, which is often um, fuel oil in Maine. Um, so in these households, there's some split in the um, heat provided between the, the heat pump that's installed and the legacy um, fuel oil system. Um, and so, so we've modeled these uh, installations as kind of being partially, partially served by heat pumps um, and electric heating. Um, and that percentage increases a little bit over time as heat pump technology improves and um, households become more likely to install multiple heat pumps um, to meet a larger fraction of the load as the cost, cost effectiveness of doing so improves. Um, and then separately, we have whole home heat pump systems in our model. And this uh, is essentially modeling when um, the existing system burns out or is otherwise retired uh, and is replaced entirely by heat pumps um, that, that perhaps have some electric resistance backup, but no um, fossil fuel uh, heating system that's left in place. Um, and these installations uh, grow later um, in the later years of our modeling. Um, and then in the commercial sector, we, we only include the whole building heat pumps. We don't, we don't have the um, retrofit option there. So this chart show, or these charts show um, how many heat pumps are installed each year in our modeling um, in two of the aggressive electrification scenarios. So on, on the top, we have our H1 and H2 scenarios. Um, and on the bottom, we have our H4 scenario where we, we started with that same trajectory and shifted some of the adoption forward in time um, so that more heat pumps would be in place by 2030. Um, one important note about these charts is that they're showing number of households, which can be different than the number of heat pumps, um, because a, a household can have multiple heat pumps installed. So there's a little bit of a difference between these charts um, and Maine's current goal of achieving 100,000 uh, heat pump installations by 2025. Um, so as you can see in the H4 scenario, we, we've increased um, adoption of whole home heat pumps, uh, which is shown in this darker green color to uh, pretty, pretty early in the 2020s. And we see that um, market share grow as um, more people whose, whose heating systems are, are burning out are replacing them with heat pumps instead of um, replacing them with um, boilers or furnaces. Um, and that, that occurs across uh, fuel types for fuel oil, natural gas, um, propane and, and others. Um, so as we add all of these heat pumps, um, we see that uh, elect electricity consumption um, grows quite significantly for thermal end uses. So we're showing space and water heating in particular in this chart. This does not show um, other end uses such as lighting or refrigeration um, or electronics. Um, so we see that by 2050, um, in the scenarios that rely primarily on electrification, we see something around seven terawatt hours of um, load for thermal end uses in residential and commercial buildings, which is a significant portion of Maine's total electricity consumption, which is around 11 terawatt hours. Uh, today. And then again, as we saw in transportation, that's that's a little bit lower um, if you rely on on low carbon fuels instead, um, and and a little bit lower with in the scenarios that include more weatherization. And uh, on this chart, we've now added back in all of the other um, electric end uses in the same set of buildings. So, so this does include those non-thermal end uses. Um, and we can see that by uh, 2030, we already have um, a significant increase in electricity consumption in the H4 scenario, where we uh, moved a lot of the heat pump adoption up um, into the 2020s. And by 2050, um, in most of the decarbonization scenarios, buildings are consuming um, just under twice as much electricity as they do today. 
um, an increase of, again, about seven, seven to eight terawatt hours per year. Um, and so to, to wrap up the building section, um, we've plotted here the impact on emissions um, of each of these scenarios. We had kind of a modest reduction in emissions uh, focused on the, the earlier years in our baseline as a result of current policies that are promoting heat pumps in the 2020s. Um, and all of our decarbonization scenarios result in 90% or greater um, emissions reductions by 2050, um, as this is one of the sectors that's, that's seen as more promising for um, electrification and, and clean technologies that we already have available today. Um, and then the, once again, the, the H3 and H4 scenarios see emissions reductions uh, a little sooner than the H1 and H2 scenarios. Um, and that's again due to, in, in the case of H3, the use of low carbon fuels, which can be substituted in um, relatively quickly. And then in H4, um, kind of moving, moving up a lot of that heat pump adoption and also a, a little bit of an increase in weatherization in the 2020s. So H4 is achieving a 35% emissions reduction um, by 2030 relative, relative to 2020. Okay, great. Thank you, Jason. So next I'm gonna cover the electric sector and then I'm gonna move into the economy-wide emissions trajectories. And then at that point, we'll have an opportunity for questions and discussion. So the electric sector modeling is um, the more complex modeling that we do. It takes um, multiple weeks to kind of run this model. Again, it's a New England-wide model of the New York ISO grid. And we did not uh, update this modeling at this point. Um, we did a baseline electric sector model, uh, which again was a sustained policy modeling scenario. Um, and this was really just looking forward based on Maine's existing set of policies and programs, 8% uh, renewable portfolio standard by 2030, um, kind of baseline efficiency gains, maintaining nuclear units, and uh, assuming that the New England Clean Energy Connect uh, as a transmission facility from Canada is constructed and, and can deliver um, clean um, or deliver electricity from Hydro-Quebec. The E1 scenario uh, is the decarbonization policy scenario. And for this scenario, uh, we use the load outputs from T1, the transportation uh, scenario and H1 uh, load profiles for the building sector. Um, scenario. So I wanted to um, just show you here uh, in this chart, this is uh, new, we have not included this in our prior slides. Uh, this really shows you the increase in electricity consumption, taking what Jason just presented and integrating both the transportation and the electric uh, sector load growth associated with uh, EVs and uh, increased adoption of heat pumps. And so we'll see that uh, as noted in Jason's presentation that there is a larger uh, sooner growth in electricity demand for transportation and building sectors. And we can see at this chart, uh, it's above the T1, which is the yellow line. Um, and this uh, in 2030, the T, uh, T4H4 uh, is an additional 1.16 terawatt hours of electricity in 2030 relative to the T1 H1 scenario in 2030. So in terms of Maine's electrical demand, this represents about 10% of total electricity consumption in the state of Maine. Whereas uh, when you look New England wide, it represents uh, just under 1%. So it's our contention that uh, that 1% uh, increase in New England wide demand for electricity would have, excuse me, would have a minimal impact in terms of market outcomes and the prices of wholesale power in the New England system. Uh, and in terms of the uh, build out of various uh, sources of generation. So uh, we are uh, comfortable in, in kind of presenting this. We, even though um, this electric modeling scenario is based on the T1 uh, building and transportation work that we have done prior. 
And again, as Jason noted, um, you know, the T4 and the H4 really um, conceived of over the past six weeks, driven by um, our recognition that we uh, were not quite at our 2030 goal. And this scenario, again, is designed to achieve that 45% reduction in GHG emissions uh, from the 1990 baseline. <clears throat> so this is um, a chart that shows the uh, sources of generation for the baseline or the sustained policy approach that we've uh, referenced. And so uh, we can see New England wide and the baseline electrical demand is relatively flat from 2020 to 2050. And this uh, is uh, largely due to um, continued efficiency gains across the New England region. Uh, there is some level of vehicle adopt, EV adoption and heat pumps, uh, but the increased demand for electricity in those sectors is largely offset by the um, gains in efficiency that we see across New England. So most of, um, there's still a significant role for nuclear and natural gas in this uh, sustained policy approach. But uh, as we can see, there is also quite uh, a significant and growing role for renewable forms of energy in the New England region, as most states have aggressive renewable portfolio standards across the region, again, to drive down carbon emissions and achieve uh, state greenhouse gas emission goals. Now turning to the um, decarbonization policy uh, based on um, what we call the E1. And we see uh, significant growth in electrical consumption across New England. And that's driven by uh, an assumption that uh, all New England states, we assumed, pursued a similar path to Maine in terms of aggressive electrification of vehicles and buildings. So we're seeing across New England, a uh, growing demand for electricity, again, driven by uh, electric vehicle charging and electricity use in buildings from the adoption of heat pumps. We did not assume, however, that all New England states adopted uh, what we assumed for Maine, which was a 100% RPS by 2050. We assumed that all New England states maintain their existing RPS programs and as a result, our modeling uh, shows a significant increase in the use of natural gas New England wide to meet the increasing demand for electricity from EV charging and heat pump technology. Uh, there still is a significant and growing role for hydro, wind and solar in this policy scenario. But again, uh, given the fact that we did not assume other New England states adopted similar uh, aggressive RPS as Maine, as we assumed in the uh, E1 scenario of 100% RPS by 2050. So in fact, we see uh, New England wide uh, greenhouse gas emissions based on our modeling actually increases. And there was quite a bit of discussion among the energy working group on this. And there has been a proposal to do uh, an alternative modeling run that would look at um, others, look at a scenario whereby all other New England states adopted a high renewables uh, scenario going forward, uh, and that's still in process. So just to give you a sense of uh, how the infrastructure uh, here in the state of Maine transforms from 2020 um, versus uh, the sustained policy versus the decarbonization policy, we see uh, more aggressive growth in wind generation in the state of Maine based on the decarbonization policy. We also see a significant growth in uh, solar, both uh, behind the, both uh, distributed solar and more centralized uh, utility scale solar. Uh, again, the decarbonization relative to uh, the sustained baseline policy. So there, uh, this just gives you again a sense of uh, the deployment of wind, solar and storage technologies in the state of Maine with the decarbonization policy relative to the sustained baseline policy scenario. So now moving to the last part of our presentation, uh, the economy-wide emissions. We kind of roll this all up and uh, report the emissions based on um, the standard methodology that we understand is used in the state of Maine for greenhouse gas accounting. And I do believe that there will be some modifications to that as Melanie suggested in their update. Uh, and this graph here demonstrates that the sustained policy approach 
uh, would not achieve Maine's greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. So if Maine continues on its current path with its existing policies and programs, the state of Maine would fall well short of meeting both its 2030 and its 2050 greenhouse gas emission goals. <clears throat> so 20 in uh, 2050, total emissions would be um, 13.8 million metric tons which is uh, 9.6 million metric tons above what the 2050 target is, just to put this uh, into a little bit of context. So the most recent modeling that we've just completed, um, in fact, does show a pathway towards meeting both the 2030 and the 2050 greenhouse gas reduction goals that the, Maine, that the state of Maine has established. And by 2030, um, <clears throat> we are at uh, greenhouse gas emissions of 11.667 million metric tons, which is um, uh, direct, <laughs> exactly equal to the 45% uh, below 1990 levels uh, that the state has committed to. And in fact, uh, by 2050, we actually overshoot uh, by a small amount the uh, goal um, missions are 3.72 million metric tons, and that's 82% below 1990 levels. Um, so that's 2% um, more emissions reductions than we, we would have required by state uh, statute uh, in terms of 80% by 1990 levels. So we have um, developed a scenario which achieves the 2030 goal, and as well as uh, achieving the 2050 goal. And as um, Melanie, as I'm sorry, as <coughs> Hannah and Sarah mentioned, um, this is uh, a compass. This is a trajectory that the state um, can use to guide near-term steps to put in place policies and programs that would begin the process of transforming Maine's energy economy. And just to bring into a little bit focus uh, what this looks like in 2030, uh, emissions from transportation are still uh, the majority of emissions um, in the state at uh, 44%. Next, we have um, the uh, residential emissions are 16%, uh, commercial emissions from commercial buildings, 11%, and then um, other emissions, uh, 1.6 million metric tons. Uh, and again, this just gives you a sense of um, what the breakout of uh, emissions would be by sector in 2030, again, based on our most recent modeling results. And the final slide here, just to bring this into even uh, clearer focus, is this provides to you um, specific metrics in terms of what would be required by sector, again, based on our scenario, the number of light duty EVs on the road in 2025 in our scenario would be 41,375. I mean, that's in 2025, ramping up to over 200,000 in 2030. And then by 2050, uh, most, uh, electric, most vehicles on the road would be electric vehicles. And I won't go through each of these. You can uh, look at them uh, and I'll leave this slide up for a moment, but I just again wanted to bring into focus uh, what um, the transformation might look like. And again, this is uh, hopefully valuable to develop policies and programs that would put Maine on a trajectory that would meet its uh, commitment to uh, greenhouse gas reductions and addressing um, the climate crisis. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to uh, Sarah or David and Jason and I, and I believe uh, Hannah, there's some other um, committee members that wanna make some comments and uh, we're happy to open it up to questions and, and conversation. So again, thank you uh, for your time this afternoon and we look forward to uh, responding to questions and discussion. Super, thanks Steve, thanks Jason, that's fantastic, okay. So Sarah, you had some thoughts about this that really builds off this slide here, and then we'll have some quick comments from some folks about what this really means from a policy perspective and objectives. Um, Sarah, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and share what you wanted to share about the implications for what people can expect in the, in the Climate Action Report? 
Thanks, David. Um, Jason, could I ask you to pull the or see whoever has the, the screen share? Could you pull that down? Because I have one that I'm going to put up. Um, and so just a reminder here that the, the purpose of the modeling is to help inform the policies and the targets that the Climate Council chooses to adopt, right? So as Steve described, this is a scenario for getting us to where we want to go. And as Hannah talked about, there are lots of things that could change between now and then. But just to take Steve's um, slide one step further, we talked at our, at our last meeting about how, oh, let's go, there we go. Under each strategy, we have specific actions that are recommended and under each action, we have particular targets and outcomes. And so as we start to think about, um, this is the one that I wanted to show. As we start to think about the different targets that we're setting under our different policies, that's where the modeling becomes really useful because we can say, okay, if this is the path that we wanna go forward on, as Steve showed, how does that translate into numbers of electric vehicles? How does that translate into percentages of new vehicles sold and into EVs that um, are on the road, vehicle mile traveled reduced, into heat pumps that are installed and homes that are weatherized. And so this is um, part of what we wanted to be able to fill in with the modeling results with the Climate Council is how do we take the modeling and use it to start to inform the targets and the outcomes that we think that our policies could achieve. The other thing I wanted to show was just to highlight that in terms of the EV targets, um, we're not alone <laughs> in the need to, to get a lot of uh, zero emissions vehicles on the road in the next few years. So. Um, Maine is part of the U.S. Climate Alliance, and so we worked, we reached out to the U.S. Climate Alliance to find out what other states have for their EV targets for 2025, and so I also just wanted to, to share this slide to show that Maine, um, if, we, if we set a target of 41,000, would be very consistent with Rhode Island, with Vermont, um, we'd be significantly lower than Massachusetts, Maryland, Connecticut, North Carolina, but that lots of states are looking at the need to really encourage EV adoption as part of their decarbonization strategy in terms of reducing their emissions. And as Joyce has pointed out to us, um, many times the technology really is evolving so fast. Um, and so it's not just what Maine will do, but what the market will do and how we position ourselves to be ready to take advantage of those changes. So with that, Hannah, is there anything you wanna add there? No, I think that's helpful. And I think the idea of the EV was just to put this pretty bold thing in context, which I think Sarah has just done well. Um, so no, I have I have nothing else. I think we thought that asking um, a couple of the, the co-chairs who are involved in the work to lead into this modeling would be helpful. And I would say, especially in the case of, of Michael Stoddard and, and Dan Burgess, they, they will have also be part of the group to help implement some of these incredibly ambitious things. So I think hearing from them on, on how this lands with them, they've been involved in some of the creation of these numbers. So I think we'll ask David to call on them. Um, I will say specifically on the weatherization, Michael Stoddard and I were just actually going back and forth earlier today on what doubling weatherization would look like. And we had come up with some larger numbers. So we'll go back and forth with Synapse on how to make sure that that number is right or think about the couple different programs that, that lead into those numbers. So David, I'll let you take sure. it from there. Thanks, Hannah. I wonder, Dan Burgess, if you want to just kick off quickly, just a, a few thoughts about these numbers. Uh, when you see them, how you see them uh, translating into policy, like what's your reaction quickly to these numbers? Then we'll go to, to Michael Stoddard. Yeah, so I think that the numbers are extremely helpful, and I think I really like the um, um, term of, of kind of the compass, right, directionally, this kind of help, helps provide that compass of, of, of where the pathway that we're going down, and I think in many ways, you know, having the numbers there makes them definitely feel ambitious, but also um, um, the overall was the direction that, you know, we were heading down before, heading the pathway down, uh, the path we were on uh, previously. And so I think, um, you know, having that is certainly illustrative for us as we think about what we need to recommend and, and you know, really in some ways the urgency that, that, that comes with some of these recommendations and needing to, needing to keep things moving. I, I'm, I'm really glad Sarah put up the 
figures of comparisons with other states. You know, if you look at, you know, the Rhode Island number for EVs is about the same, but they have a, you know, obviously their state is smaller, but they've got um, close to the same population. We're, we're a little bit bigger. They've got a million. We've got 1.3 million people. And Vermont actually is like 600,000 people. Um, so if you look at kind of their ambitions on EVs, this kind of seems to put us uh, at least in that in, in the ballpark of those. And so I, th I think that's really helpful. So, um, yeah, ambitious, um, uh, directionally important, um, but really useful information. Thanks, Dan. Michael, I'm interested to hear your thoughts, particularly how it might translate into policy, both on the, uh, particularly on the, the heat pump side of things, but also on the uh, electrification transportation. Well, one thing I'd say, David, is that it doesn't have to have policy implications for the next few years. Um, at least with regard to the heat pumps, we're fortunate to have a, an established funding stream right now that for which heat pumps are not only eligible, but are a really good fit. And so that's part of the reason we've been successful for the last couple of years in building up a heat pump program for both heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. So that's part of the reason I'm actually reasonably comfortable that between now and 2025, these are achievable. They're, they're a stretch goal for sure, but they are achievable. We're now ramping, just for context for folks to know, we're ramping up this year on pace, even with COVID, to install 17,000 heat pumps in homes across the state. Uh, that's, a, that's a doubling from where we were a year ago. Um, and we have a revenue stream to help pay for that. So if we just keep that up, we will be well on our way to the 2025 goal. Now, what happens after that really will be dependent on some policy because then I think the funding stream starts to dry up. But, but, but right now it looks like we would be okay to get there. So that I mean, people should feel good about that, that this is not some um, pie in the sky uh, target to set with regard to heating systems and, and water heating systems. Um, and same with weatherization, although the funding streams there is more challenging in my estimation, but uh, right now annually efficiency main through the market, market driven programs is doing something in the neighborhood of 1200 weatherization projects per year. And main housing is doing another 250 to 500 weatherization projects a year. So if you want to know what doubling looks like, that's what it looks like. And they spend, uh, main housing spends something like, um, I don't know, five to $10 million a year doing their part of it. And we spend another $4 million a year doing our part of it for weatherization. So you want to double it? you're talking about twice that amount of money. Um, so for both of those, it looks pretty good. The EV stuff, I guess I'll speak to since um, Joyce is not on, but um, yeah, we're, we're not as far along with electric vehicles. You know, we uh, were fortunate to get funds from Volkswagen a couple of years ago. And if, the, if and when the funds come through from the NECEC settlement, we may have We'd be fortunate to have some more money that we don't have to ask taxpayers for to, to uh, support these programs. So we did 600 vehicles last year in a, in a 12 month period. Um, so we would really need to see it pick up, you know, that that's going to be the one where it's going to have to really accelerate. And um, again, we'll be fortunate that for the next several years, we should have good funding available to support that at a very reasonable level. Um, but at some point, and I think this ties into a conversation that was had at our most recent meeting, we're going to have to look at market-based solutions and regulatory solutions, because I don't think some of these things you'll be able to pay for all out of the public fisc. I think we're going to have to transform the marketplace so that this is what main dealers sell and what main vendors sell. And this is what main customers buy. That's just what you do. Great. Thanks, Michael. I wonder if um, Ken. I, could I, David, could I just throw in one other data point for sure. people? Um, Mainers buy about 70,000 cars a year. So these numbers might freak you out when you first see them about the number of electric vehicles. But um, 
it never ceases to amaze me how many cars we buy as a society and how much money we spend on them. So um, if we can just increase the percentage of those total sales and we, if we get to work on it now and we, and we keep going for nine years in a row, I think we'll get there. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And then Ken, as co-chair of that energy group with the uh, working group with Dan Burgess, um, sure. just reflections that you would have about what you saw today. Yeah, a couple of, a couple of thoughts. Uh, thank you, David. Um, one is, I think Dan and, and Michael hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, Michael just talked about market transformation, and I think that'll happen. It'll be good if the state can encourage that to some degree. But um, I'm always reminded in these situations that the iPhone is just over 10 years old. We're looking at 10 years to get to 2030, you know, nine years, close enough. Um, and, and nobody forced people to buy smartphones. They were just so demonstrably much better that people went out and bought them. Well, there's a demonstrably much better vehicle in terms of mileage, cost, operating, maintenance, acceleration, et cetera, out there, which is approaching, which is already at um, a level cost of ownership, if you count in the fuel, and soon it'll be a first price cost of ownership as well, and those we know as EVs. On top of that, uh, what, what we've done here is create a, um, an equivalence situation where for applications that are going to be trickier, like heavy duty, uh, hydrogen will have an opportunity to play and hybrids like um, uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles as opposed to battery electric vehicles will also have an opportunity to, to play as well. So there may be some role for liquid fuels going forward. Um, I also reflect on the fact that Synapse had to model this and Steve said that the electricity uh, uh, you know, figures, the revised modeling run that he talked about is not in yet. Um, but it shows enormous amounts of gas. That's because of the regional system. And, you know, the model, the model predicts, takes the lowest cost thing for the options it has. Um, uh, I don't know, Steve, maybe I want to go into more detail, but I saw capacity for demand response and I saw capacity for storage, but I didn't see any terawatt hours. Which, to, which is to say those resources were on the verge of, they're becoming cost effective. They're already in play in some other states uh, and they're not included in here. So that's operating to our favor as well. And then just the last thought, um, you know, this, this is not a prediction, it's a pathway. Uh, a lot will change and we have a lot of time in which to change it. But ultimately at the end of the day, having just become aware of two feedback loops on climate change that are starting to kick in. Less Arctic ice, which means we absorb more heat, which means we'll accelerate faster without even emitting more, more emissions. And likewise, some evidence that methane hydrates are starting to unfreeze and, and uh, that methane goes in the air. Once again, because of climate change, it'll create more climate change. We have to act on this. This is very urgent, or we'll be paying for it just in different ways, like storms, like human health, like disaster, so forth. So this is, this is a pathway. I'm pleased that we've gotten this far. Will it reflect our future? Not precisely, no. Is it a good step in the right direction and a good compass, as Dan says? Yes. Thanks, David. Thanks, Ken. And David, I just would quickly comment, um, first of all, I know that Melanie is out there somewhere. Her power went out during this call, so she was driving to her parents. So she's with us, but buried somewhere in there or maybe in transit. Um, but just to Ken's point on, on equivalence, we did spend a fair amount of time thinking about, um, I know Bruce Van Noe did a good presentation about thinking about you know, plug-in hybrids. Certainly, I know that, that we, are, we are planning to embrace used uh, EV and hybrid vehicles. And then is there a role for cleaner vehicles? So I, I, I know Jason and uh, Steve didn't model it in exactly this way, but when we hear about you know, California's highly ambitious announcement, they're thinking about how you know, a plug-in hybrid that goes 40 miles, you, know, you sort of think about the use case for that vehicle and or you know, how many of those vehicles does it take to equal one EV? And there, does, there is opportunity for encouraging multiple pathways, but obviously 
it requires more of those types of vehicles than it does one EV. So I think, um, and, and the same thing could be said in some of the, the heating sector, some of the varying alternative pathways to get there. This is one pathway. There are other equivalents that could help us get there, but this at least shows you what needs to happen. So um, Jason's also posting the, the debate about the uh, vehicle sales uh, between Judy and Michael and others about the number of vehicle sales in Maine per year. Um, so David, I think it'd be helpful to just open it up to people's questions and comments and, and Steve and Jason will stick with us to help answer hard questions. Excellent, thanks. Okay, so let's do our usual, if we can raise our hands in the, in the Zoom function, that would be ideal. Um, there's two layers of questions, right? That you may have. Questions about how the modeling was done and then questions about the implications for what will be in your report, right? Filling in those little X's with these numbers in that chart that Sarah presented, okay? So um, let's just open it up and see what doubts folks have um, about what you've heard today. Any reactions? It was so thorough and complete, we've overwhelmed everyone. <laughs> what? <laughs> As you are thinking about what you want to say, potentially, um, I'll signal that later this week, you'll receive a new version of the Climate Action Plan from Sarah uh, and Cassie and team. And that new version will fill in those X's that were there before with the numbers you're seeing today. So that's how this translates into a product that, that you, uh, you are building. Uh, Senator Brownie, Carson, go ahead, please. There, unmuted. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Um, the factor that leaps off the page at me is, and I'm sure others, is cost. And I was thinking about this as I um, reviewed the language in the first roughly half of the of the uh, of the draft report this morning. Um, and in um, well, obviously, there's cost of the investment in, uh, in terms of the public purse, as well as as well as market incentives and disincentives, in cleaner cars and heat pumps in EVs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I made a list, which is probably not complete, um, of the cost of not acting. Uh, and as Ken was saying, this. Um, could be characterized, I think, as a freight train coming at us. You have health impacts, have uh, flooding and storm damage, um, have uh, impacts of high heat, health, and other, um, just necessity for cooling in residential and, and, uh, and commercial spaces to start with. Um, the loss of ecosystem services, which is a little bit arcane. People in the environmental community have been talking about this for some years, but um, I think it may become much more real in Maine with flooding, storm damage, et cetera. Um, loss of forest land, which is given a small part, but an important part and, and the resulting uh, loss of sequestration. Um, and then loss of infrastructure. And we've talked a little bit about that. And of course, it depends on whether we would expect or project sea level rise of one and a half feet over X years, or I think 8.8 .8 was the high point between now and, and 2100. So I, I'm not sure at what point we begin putting dollar figures on the cost of the steps that the modeling has just walked through. Um, but as we do that, or in fact, I, I would argue in terms of the report before we do that, um, we should take a crack at least in a range and probably do this graphically um, of the cost of climate impacts based upon a failure to act so that we're not 
and there, there there's a question in here. I, I'd like to ask our, our modelers if they are if they are beginning or engaged in the calculation of cost. And I understand if they're not, but 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 so that there isn't so that there's context and not just total and complete sticker shock of 40,000 EVs and you know a million heat pumps and and uh, and all the other infrastructure that goes with this. So apologize for rambling a little bit, but this the the modeling and and the numbers have really brought home the very significant cost of uh, of changing, updating, and 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 slowing um, the harm from uh, climate change and climate disruption. But there's this other side of it, which are the are the essential um, savings that we're gonna we're gonna need to reap uh, in order to help pay for those. So is, it, it, does any is is this an appropriate time to talk about cost, or does that go in a in a bin that uh, we come back to? Well, no, I think Senator Carson, that's a good question, and and Steve can can we didn't ask them to do cost modeling, but Steve can I'm sure can give you some good answer to that. I know that Charles from ERG is on the call as well, and he um, helped perform the cost of doing nothing, which doesn't quantify the entire cost of inaction, but at least starts to get at some of those costs. And I would say the complete number is, is probably unknown, <laughs> um, but at least the beginning costs are pretty... Um, Pretty, at, a, at a pretty significant magnitude as it is just for transportation and major infrastructure upgrades that need to happen in the relatively uh, near future. Um, and I would say Michael sort of started off with a discussion of, you know, what does doubling weatherization look like cost-wise to meet this target? I think clearly Efficiency Main uh, manages a number of the programs and um, they already have funding, but not probably adequate funding to meet all of the incentives and requirements. So I think at least the good news is we are already spending some money as a state on some of these areas. Is it the full amount? And, and I, I think your, your question, Browning, to that is still um, something that I think we are um, grappling with and it's important to be clear about. So Steve, I'll let you, if you have any further comments, and I don't know if Charles is out there, wants to comment on Brownie's cost of doing nothing question. And then again, you, you could ask Michael for the full uh, back of the envelope by 2030, but we might give him a few more days. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, uh, Hannah. Um, so yeah, no, I think, um, you know, obviously uh, th those are important considerations. And, um, you know, we uh, did not um, specifically begin developing cost assessments. But I know uh, that um, ERG did take some of the strategies and kind of evaluated kind of the benefit and cost and kind of high, low, medium in terms of opportunities. Um, you know, in terms of transportation, uh, you know, it's, it's of all the strategies, um, electric vehicle adoption is, is widely understood as kind of the least cost approach to addressing transportation related emissions. Um, you know, I think similarly in terms of um, Building sector heat pumps are, are viewed, uh, particularly if you're displacing fuel oil, um, that displaced uh, cost of energy uh, can justify on a, on, a, on a straight up investment basis, uh, adopting heat pump in terms of retrofit or even whole home heat pumps. Um, so again, we didn't do um, roll up kind of a full cost assessment. I know that there's were some analysis that was done by ERG on that issue, um, but um, I haven't looked at that uh, recently, so I apologize. I can't comment uh, further. I think we lost Charles, but um, Sarah, I mean, again, I think the Climate Council has, has seen that report. And again, I think, Brownie, your point is taken, and I think the side-by-side -side is really what your sort of how we present this to the state in terms of the potential cost of these actions is actually minor compared to the greater long-term cost of not taking these actions. I think that's right, Hannah. I just want to make sure when this is rolled out, presented, that the context, as, as much as we can do the full context, um, financial, human health, infrastructure, loss of work time, um, 
creating the jobs, particularly, and it's referenced in the draft report, creating jobs coming out of a pandemic period when a great many jobs have been lost or at least uh, sidelined for some period of time. There is a context here that particularly because of political polarization is gonna be really important to get as right as we can get it so that there isn't all this blowback of, oh, well, this, you know, this climate plan must have been drafted by people who don't wrestle with um, the finances of operating uh, government and government programs or government related programs um, with, uh, with a note to fiscal sanity. That, that's, and thank you for indulging me. It just, that sort of hit home as I was reading the, I'm gonna turn my phone off now um, this morning. All right, wonderful. I see Michael is unmuted. He might have um, a thought. Well, I, I don't disagree with anything Browning just said. I, I think um, it will be incumbent upon us to create that context. Um, but I, I think we may want to try a variety of strategies to frame these costs. Um, so first of all, there are a number of elements of this plan that involve investments in things that cost less than the, than the, uh, the or that will achieve a saving. So we would um, sort of traditionally refer to these as the no regrets policies, things like energy efficiency, which has been sort of a classic no regrets uh, strategy to get started with because you end up saving people more money than they were paying before. So those aren't very controversial um, and you can get pretty far with those, but you obviously, uh, and now we're starting to see similar things with renewables. So we're seeing solar and wind prices come down to a level where you actually be paying less. So I think part of, uh, and, and I would just extend that, that um, logic to what we're seeing with heat pumps right now and heat pump water heaters, and we won't be that far off for electric vehicles. Um, the operating cost of electric vehicles should be less, and it is less under today's prices. Um, they have an upfront but I, so I just don't want to, I don't want to, I don't think we should as a group um, sugarcoat that there will be costs, but I think we should frame them as investments that need to be made because one of the other big pieces of context is we're, we're not doing this alone. It's not, Maine is not going to be the only one. Our country is going to be doing this for the next 10 years. And if we are uh, at the head of the pack and making these investments and in transforming our economy so that every household and every small business and every paper mill and every hospital is doing this and, and positioning itself to be uh, ready to live in a carbon constrained world where carbon is expensive, we're going to win. We're going to have the lowest cost materials and services and goods and and. Uh, and and household savings. And uh, so we'll be the envy of the country if we move um, intelligently and, and invest str strategically. And, you know, I see Pat's on, on as well, and we could be looking, and we will be looking at our forest products industry in exactly the same way. So um, our ability to sequester carbon um, should put us in a great spot. So this work that we're doing now is this we'll be doing for the next decade. And I think we got to think of it that way, but I think we got to pitch it that way too. Thanks, Michael. Other reactions? Such a well-behaved group for a Monday. Uh, I guess I would just chime in. I. I completely agree with uh, uh, Brownie's uh, statements and, and appreciate Michael's, of course. Um, I would be cautious to try to do one-on-one -on -one kinds of cost effectiveness because often it's the human health uh, consequences that uh, outweigh all of the other benefits. And so framing the kinds of costs and Brownie, you ran down a list of factors, um, but pointing to other uh, studies and analyses uh, where, where we see the benefits, and in this case, the co-benefits, uh, or benefits of co-pollutants as well, uh, with reducing uh, greenhouse gases. 
uh, would potentially be a big number, but also a big challenge to quantify that for the state of Maine in the time frame uh, that we have. And so, pointing to that as a uh, as a contribution of uh, this pathway, I think is is really critical. Uh, and how we do that, I think we should be thoughtful about. Thanks. And I, I'll just add to this conversation that in our conversations with the governor on this, and she's engaged with the Climate Council's work and, and feels uh, positive about the direction we're heading. I think she feels strongly, especially in this time period, that the, the co-benefits, I mean, there are multiple kinds of co-benefits, but you know, heat pumps uh, can offer a savings to a homeowner, especially with the incentives that we have right now, if, if installed. Um, again, weatherization makes people's uh, heating bills lower and their homes more comfortable. So there's, there's sort of lots of Benefits. So I think Brownie to the quantifying the um, benefits, really selling the overall, improving people's lives, saving them on their monthly checkbooks, um, as well as sort of the big picture factor of um, the the number of the amount of money Maine spends every year on you know out of state fossil fuel companies. So bringing that money back to Maine with jobs and benefits, with renewable energy, with with wood products, with the kinds of things that we can produce in Maine. It's it's both a stability, a potential cost savings, and a boost to our economy. So that messaging will will definitely be, um, you know, we've all talked about that a lot as we've as we've gone along. We know the governor feels incredibly strongly about those pieces and we'll keep trying to highlight it as we explain why these actions um, they, you know, they require effort, but they actually have benefits for people's lives. Is there anything else we'd like to say about this? Thoughts we have? Okay, great. All right, so um, Hannah and Sarah, why don't we talk a little bit about what folks can expect in the coming days? Um, about getting this next version of the, the sort of final draft report. Um, Hannah, do you want to walk us through that? Yes, I think Sarah is currently driving to pick a child up at school. So our vehicle miles traveled will come down. I keep making this point when when the kids are all on the school bus again. Um, and then those school buses become EVs, right, Scott Brown? Um, so the our team is um, working aggressively uh, to get you another draft by the end of this week. Um, I will say that it's we, many of you have been super helpful offering, you know, concerns, specific suggestions, kind of messages you really hope are highlighted. So um, again, thank you for those. Um, the you will all receive a draft. We will be in touch with you with some kind of survey early next week, and then. The game plan as we move towards the November 12th meeting is to just, you know, make sure we know where each of you are, any concerns you have, and the November 12th will be the meeting in which we hope to approve this plan. It will still get editing, you know, some wordsmithing, some additional a letter from the governor and, and, and some narratives added, pretty pictures, that kind of stuff, but really the, the substance of it and the actions we are recommending and are they the right ones, um, please you know, really read this draft and ideally stay in touch with us early next week on, um, you know, anything that you, you know, have a minor concern with or a really major concern. Cause I think we're just, you know, we may not be able to accommodate all people's concerns because this is a 39 member group trying to come to consensus, but so far people have been super helpful in staying in touch and staying engaged. And, you know, I think that is, essentially our process moving towards November 12th. And, and really from there, we'll hopefully that will go well and we'll really try to put the pieces together for a December 1 final report, some kind of announcement that we hope as many of you as possible can be engaged in. Um, given the world we're living in, it, it will likely be virtual in some way, um, but that is the direction. So happy to answer any other process questions or maybe David can help if he has any other specifics to add. I don't I think that's a great summary. Um, any questions about what's gonna be happening in the next 10 days or so? And then leading up to your December one report. I have a question, this is yeah. Lydia. Um, the report is going to include all of the work groups reports or is it 
are those kind of just been subsumed into the report? What exactly the report is going to have a lot of attachments, I, I presume. Yeah, I mean, I, so Lydia, it's a good question that we're continuing to go back and forth with. I don't think the council has sort of voted off the island any of the ideas that came out of the working groups. I mean, clearly not all the words are able to be in the final plan. Um, we are imagining a a sort of high level pretty version for the public with some printed copies and a good online version with links at least to every working group report for full details. So you wanna read the full details on X idea, you know, the resilience working group came up with it and here it is. So I, we will certainly append all of those. And again, in the online world, it's easy to do that. So at least that's my thought, Lydia. And I think that is a good sort of question for our staff in the council to just clarify as we get to the final report. Right. Representative Bloom, not Lydia. She's she's all things. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Great, everybody. Well, thanks for joining us for this uh, extra meeting to see all this. As as Hannah did say, Director Director Pingree instructions is read the read what comes in your mailbox on Thursday or Friday. It's really important. There'll be a survey either attached to it or shortly thereafter. Also important, it'll be short. It won't be like we, what we did before. It'll be a five question survey kind of thing. Um, and so those are really important that we dive in and also really important that you pick up the phone, call Hannah or others if, uh, if something jumps out at you, you wanna work on. Okay, take care everybody. Have a great afternoon. Happy Monday, all the best. Yeah.